Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar was only 37 years old when he was handed the responsibility of heading one of Malaysia's largest government linked firms in the form of United Engineers Malaysia Berhad in 2001. Having been among a number of high achievers earmarked to help spearhead Malaysia's reform agenda, in the early 2000s. It was a difficult job to be sure since there were political pressures on top of the daily decisions that had to be made at the corporate level. But since then, Tan Sri Wahid has gone on to have other leadership roles at companies like Telecom Malaysia, Maybank, the state investment firm PNB, and of course most recently at the national stock exchange operator Bursa Malaysia. Many of the decisions Tan Sri Wahid Omar made through these years, through all these jobs, were I'm sure quite difficult. But to my knowledge at least, Tan Sri Wahid Omar carried himself always with the highest levels of professionalism and his trademark humble attitude, having come from such humble beginnings himself. These are traits which I think are worthy of emulating, along with his rules and principles for success, which Tan Sri Wahid shared when we chatted some weeks ago. As always, please do consider subscribing to my channel if you find value in the conversations I have with the guests on this channel, including liking this video telling me your thoughts in the comments below, and perhaps even sharing it with other people who you think might find value in these interviews. And now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, may I now present Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar. Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, you are a legend, uh, you are highly respected, and I've been waiting a long time to talk to you on this format, in, in this manner and form. Um, if we can, um, maybe start with your, you know, your or your, your early years in Johor, I think you were born in uh, 64, uh, one of, uh, um, I think, 11 or 9 children. 11. Um, not your typical, you know, elite, um, privileged background. You know, you came from quite humble beginnings. Can you describe those early years for us? Well, thanks, Chuang, for having me here uh, today. Now, uh, I was born as the, as the ninth child uh, in a family of 11 siblings. Um, and um, my parents, um, Haji Omar and Haji Alima, um, it wasn't easy uh, for them to raise uh, 11 children, uh, but Alhamdulillah, um, you know, they did very well uh, to raise all of us. Uh, in Malay, we call it jadi orang, uh, so to speak. But life was hard when uh, we were young. Um, and as the ninth child, um, I went through a hardship uh, with the family. Uh, my father uh, used to work uh, with the British military, uh, the, the civil side uh, in Singapore. Uh, but when the British uh, military pulled out of Singapore, uh, I think this was back in 1969, uh, so he was retrenched uh, and he worked as a labourer uh, in the pencil factory uh, in Johor um, But it was tough uh, for all of us. So uh, I still remember uh, there was one time I wanted to join the Boy Scouts uh, in primary school and you needed some money to buy a uniform. Um, so I asked my mum for five ringgit to buy the uniform and uh, we didn't have five ringgit. Um, so obviously, uh, that's when uh, I realised that look, you know, we really need to uh, d do something to excel uh, in our studies, uh, to do well and, and to take the family out of poverty. So notwithstanding the hardship, uh, Alhamdulillah, um, we managed to pull through. Uh, we had the benefit of my uncles and aunties uh, who were very generous and sponsored uh, our education. Um, every single one of us uh, were assisted um, uh, by uh, our uncles and aunties. And uh, we managed to go through uh, education, uh, primary and secondary education. So um, when it comes to education, um, I was... Uh, Know, able to get uh, four A's and one C in our standard five uh, assessment test those days. Um, if you can guess, uh, the C was in English. Buddha <laughs> 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 um, you know, we don't speak that much uh, English uh, at home, uh, naturally, so I was struggling a bit. Uh, but um, I was fortunate because um, by that time, uh, the government had set up Maktab Runda San Mara, the Mara Junior Science Colleges. Uh, the first one was in Sremban, and uh, one of the objectives of uh, MRSM was to give um, children uh, from underprivileged background from the kampung uh, the opportunity um, to be uh, in a boarding school and, and to be given a good education. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, um, notwithstanding the four E's and one C, um, so we went through the assessment test, uh, interview, uh, and was able to uh, get into MRSM Sremban. And I think that's um, a great 
institution uh, because uh, it provided the people like me um, from underprivileged background uh, the uh, opportunity to learn uh, in a conducive environment uh, and uh, naturally uh, you have proper bed and so on at the hostels uh, you have great dedicated teachers and a good system uh, for me to go through, through all the way until uh, SPM and Alhamdulillah um, you know, at SPM uh, from the C uh, in English um, at Standard 5, uh, I was able to get an A uh, at SPM in English. Uh, so again, th that's actually what um, uh, good education can do uh, to you, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I ask people this quite often because for, for those who don't come from the you know your typical privileged background, right? Um, they have a hunger, they have this desire to succeed. They know what it's like to not have stuff, to not have food on the table, to not have access to certain things and certain privileges. And then it drives them for the rest of their lives. And many entrepreneurs and many successful corporate people have come from that background, right? Um, I'm sure you have, you retain many of those values and those characteristics because of your early years like that. Would you agree? Yeah, I, mean, I think certainly um, yeah. when you have no safety net, so to speak, yeah. um, you just have to struggle and work as hard as you can. And you tend to appreciate the, you know, what you have uh, a lot more. Um, and I think you tend to be uh, grateful uh, and you optimize uh, whatever resources. Uh, so uh, I guess that's probably why I became an accountant. And <laughs> we spoke earlier, uh, yeah. Chuang, about the, the concept of value for money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think um, for someone who had gone through a lot, um, so the concept of value for money is actually um, real. Uh, and how you stretch your ringgit yeah. or your, your dollar uh, is actually important. Okay, so, so a little segue here, right, Antri? Because um, for people who come from quite difficult backgrounds, right, and then they succeed in life and they've got suddenly, I'm not saying necessarily that you have, you know, a few hundred million, but, you know. I don't. You don't? <laughs> not, not many people do. And then and then you come to a certain vintage, like, like in a way, the collective you and I, right? Uh, but for people who come from that difficult background, they might still feel it, find it very difficult to say, oh, I'm going to have that, 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 that dish or that, that restaurant or because you know they remember it's it's so in it's seared onto their memories you know and a lot of people they don't they don't give themselves that privilege because they can't do it and then and then they 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 get older and then they can't enjoy that anymore and it's a lost opportunity you know it's also that balancing act right when it's time to say it's okay just buy that thing if you want it's okay you know do you struggle with that sometimes i wouldn't say i struggle uh, to me again um I always believe in optimization of resources. Uh, for that ringgit that you have, um, you can buy uh, a lot of things, right? Uh, if you are careful enough. Or you can actually waste it uh, on something which is uh, very short-lived. So I think, um, well, yes, I'm, I love food for sure. Uh, but um, there is a limit to how much I will spend uh, on uh, dinner or so, and so on. So again, if I can get the, um, the same experience, at a much lower cost, and I will go for that. Would I spend fifteen hundred ringgit for an omakase, uh, you know, Japanese uh, dinner? Uh, I wouldn't. Probably uh, not, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, would I spend you know uh, two hundred ringgit on a nice steak, for example? Yes, uh, probably. And um, oh, if I go to say burger and lobster, for example, um, so I spent some time in the UK. Uh, so one of my favorite joint is uh, burger and lobster. Um, yeah, so the, the lobsters there would cost uh, probably about 200 ringgit, roughly. Uh, but again, it's, um, uh, it's pricey, uh, but it is okay. Um, so I do indulge a bit, but uh, I, I wouldn't spend, uh, you know, a thousand ringgit uh, on, on a meal, uh, for example. Yeah. So the life lesson, um, financial life lesson number one to maybe a 30-year-old uh, person, right, would be to um, enhance value for money would be to think about optimization of your 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 limited ringgit, right? right? Would be one thing. How would you advise um, the thirty year old person to you know to approach financial literacy at this age? I mean, the, the basic rule is um, to make sure that you live within your means. Yeah, uh, I think that is rule number one. Um, and um, don't overspend um, and don't borrow uh, for operating expenses, to speak. Right? It's okay to borrow for capital expenditure. So that means that the, you want to buy a house, uh, you want to buy a car for you to be able to go to work, for example, uh, that's okay. Uh, something which will bring you benefit 
uh, in the medium and long term. Uh, but don't borrow to go on holiday or have a nice meal and so on. Um, I, I think that's actually very important. And then you know, the concept of value for money. Um, so I think if you plan well enough, you can get the same thing at half the price. Uh, compared to someone. So, for example, we spoke about the, my recent trip to New York. Uh, so, nine months ago, I you know, had this um, email uh, from Singapore Airlines offering uh, a premium economy ticket to New York uh, for 4,900 ringgit. Right? Uh, so, to me, okay, uh, maybe that's something which uh, I should be looking at, uh, knowing that my children, I've got two daughters, will be completing their exams in June. So, we booked nine months ahead uh, four tickets um, and paid 4,900 ringgit each. Um, so it became you know, uh, affordable uh, for us. Uh, but had we not planned, we would have had to pay double that amount. Uh, in fact, um, uh, on the last few weeks, uh, there were some you know, relatives who wanted to actually follow us on that trip. And when you look at the, the ticket, was the same ticket would have cost 13,000 ringgit per person. So that would have been... Um, unaffordable uh, and I wouldn't have spent that kind of money. So again, uh, planning is actually important uh, because when you plan early enough, um, you can get the, um, the same item at half the price, for example. A and this is how you stretch your ringgit, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. There's deals everywhere, right? And it's very important because it's a what 21-hour flight and you... Maybe you, you, you might want to think about those things when you try and fly that distance. Yeah, again, it's, um, the good thing about travel is that the, it opens up your mind. You're able to see uh, things, um, learn from them, um, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be a better person. Uh, again, it, it's um, an experience that uh, if you can afford it, the, um, uh, then you should actually um, go yeah, for it, I would say. Because yeah. yeah. it's an education, isn't it? And you see how other cultures live and you can compare and contrast. Sometimes we are too um, hard on ourselves in Malaysia. We constantly critique ourselves and, oh, we got this, we got that. But then it's only when you go abroad, then you realise, okay, it could be a lot worse than that. Even in the rich countries. I mean, I, th I think we went to Japan and I mean, many parts of America, you see homeless people in tents in, in downtown LA. It's it's incredible because it's the richest country in the world, and they got they got thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of homeless people on the street. It's crazy. Yeah, right? very true, Chong. Um, you know, uh, I've been to San Francisco, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the Silicon Valley is there. Uh, your Palo Alto and so on. You probably have the highest number of uh, rich people. Yeah. Um, in the Bay Area, uh, uh, San Francisco area, but uh, I think and. Anecdotally, uh, from physical exposure, uh, they probably have the highest number of homeless people, uh, and which is very sad. And, and when I was in New York recently, so there were news about many businesses uh, moving out of uh, the San Francisco area uh, because of uh, the uh, high crime rates and so on, uh, which is sad, uh, really. So I think this is where uh, major lessons for us, uh, in the sense that, yes, uh, we want to be successful, we want to do to grow the economy, um, you want to be a developed country, but make sure that the, we do it in an inclusive manner where no one is left behind. So I think the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, must be addressed. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that we can try and get to that whole idea, that whole conversation that people like Ray Dalio talk about in terms of the moving tectonic plates of the world where you've got big social inequality in the U.S., You've got the major powers fighting with each other, with each other U.S. and China, yeah. and then the whole spectre of technology disruption. But that, let's leave that for a little while, Tanju, okay. if you can. I want to go back, if we can, to um, your years in you know Seremban, and then, of course, onto the U.K., where you got a Mara scholarship, right? right. And I, I can't remember exactly the conversations that we had through the years, but I do remember you telling us or the press in those days that you have always been an advocate of Malaysia's social policies because it has gotten you, it gave you the platform and the opportunities to get to where you are. And if Malaysia can do that for its, you know, less and less advantaged, right. then there's something to be said, right? Can, can you talk about your ideas behind that? Those ideas? Yeah, sure. So I think um, learning from my own uh, experience. So we had the new economic policy. Uh, so with the twin objectives of firstly uh, to eradicate poverty, irrespective of race, and secondly uh, to remove any identification of uh, any economic activity to a certain race, right? Uh, I think the first one uh, is uh, perfect uh, in the sense that. You want um, to take people out of poverty 
and the best way would be to give them good education and with education uh, then they can actually um, be um, a good um, uh, you know, person in terms of a career or they go into business and so on and I think the same concept uh, must be applied um, even today uh, and, and I think this is where if you look at all the government policies successively we're talking about yes uh, we need to grow the economy but we need to do it in an inclusive manner um, and that means that you must provide the um, equitable opportunity uh, for people to uh, progress uh, in their life so um, I use the word equitable not equal uh, because you must take into account the background of the person right um, so uh, one of the things that I always get into uh, conversation with uh, my friends uh, is about scholarships uh, for example right um, uh, there are some of my friends who would say that look you know scholarship must be based on merit 100% so if a student performs well he deserves scholarship uh, I would say um, Yes and no. Yes, um, he or she would deserve a scholarship, but you must also take into account whether he or she comes from a rich or underprivileged uh, background. Because if um, he or she uh, is a son or daughter of a CEO, uh, for example, of a large company, who can afford to fund the, the education of the children on their own, then they don't deserve the scholarship. Notwithstanding that he's, he or she may be uh, the top scoring student. Uh, I'd rather give the scholarship to someone who have got the good credentials, uh, maybe not 9 A's, A+, plus, uh, maybe uh, 9 A's uh, or 8 A's, uh, but from an underprivileged background uh, in rural where the parents are actually poor and without that scholarship, he or she wouldn't be able to uh, pursue that higher education. Um, so I think this is where, uh, again, uh, on, on my part, um, I would always encourage my friends who can afford it, uh, don't apply for scholarship for your children uh, because um, allow and give that space to other children um, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to um, go abroad uh, to pursue their education, for example. Yeah, I mean, you can say the same thing about even entrepreneurs and quite seasoned corporate people who have left their jobs to come out into the entrepreneurial space and they still apply for grants even though they can afford it, you know, versus a, a, a guy from, from the kitchen of his house who is bootstrapping, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not malicious policies because the policies are the policies and they're quite well thought out. It's the ex execution of those policies. And some would say that they've been somehow disrupted through the years, right? Suffice to say, let's not get into a political discussion here, right? But um, how does Malaysia, because you've spent time in the private sector, you've spent time in the in the government sector, you know, nominally as, as a non-elected senator, right, in the right. PM's department, but this like maybe seven years ago already, right? Um, how does Malaysia map out its chart? And again, this is a segue because we haven't gone through even Telecom Malaysia and UVM yeah. and all that yet, right? <laughs> but how does Malaysia even begin to approach, you know, preparing itself for a very competitive world our ASEAN neighbours are very, very fast, very, very working very hard. Indonesia, Vietnam. You've got this looming spectre of China in the background, maybe even the spectre of a conflict between China and the US. So Malaysia's really got to up its game, right? right. But we need that the leadership to, to kind of somehow talk to people like yourselves and say, hey, what's the recipe here? Right. So, so I think um, the recipe here is, um, is about, among others, uh, apart from the actual strategies and so on, it's about us, all of us, uh, having that constructive mindset. So I always find that we Malaysians, we uh, are overly negative. We are overly preoccupied with politics. Um, and uh, we always um, look at the grass as being greener on the other side. Um, and we tend to focus on uh, the, the things that divide us as opposed to things that unite us, uh, for example. And as someone who had run organizations that operate in multiple countries, uh, the ASEAN region in particular, and other financial centers of the world, um, I've been able to see a lot of things on the other side, right? Um, and my view is actually, yes, we as a country, we in Malaysia, um, there are so many areas where we need to improve. Uh, corruption is actually one, well, for example. Uh, but uh, on balance, I think we're still uh, doing better than many other countries. And life is actually a lot more pleasant uh, here in Malaysia compared to other countries. So, uh, if only um, our people have got that constructive mindset um, and you know start to really execute uh, the strategies uh, that we have uh, charted for ourselves, 
uh, and being able to do uh, what we can within our circle of influence. And I think um, we can uh, get there a, a lot faster uh, and in a very constructive manner, uh, I would say. So uh, back to your point uh, about you know, ASEAN and China. So I think uh, make no mistake that countries with large population will always have the added advantage because they will have a huge domestic market. I mean, China is the one great example and Indonesia will be next. Uh, but I think uh, we are fortunate in the sense that we are part of ASEAN, um, six, seven hundred million people, um, although we only have uh, 30 million Malaysians uh, and then another three million um, expatriates uh, or foreign workers. Uh, but I think um, if we truly embrace the spirit of ASEAN as a single market, um, then the, you know, we can actually um, organize our strategies uh, to benefit uh, from the larger economy of ASEAN. And I think this is where, uh, talking about, say, uh, the TACOM Asia that uh, evolved into Asiata, for example, then we spoke about um, you know, Maybank, for example, CIMB Group. Um, I mean, these are the entities that operate in the region, so, and we will uh, collectively benefit uh, from the greater uh, ASEAN region as opposed to just a uh, mission domestic economy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the ASEAN Economic Community, the AEC, has been mooted for many, many years. Yeah. Some would say that it hasn't been as fast as they would like. Um, but I just want to reference your point of view. Um, and I don't know how much you've looked at this in any detail, but um, countries that which which um, punch above their weight versus their population size, right? Um, Sweden will come to mind, I, I guess. Some some mm -hmm. of the Scandinavian countries will come to, to mind. No in, in, in ASEAN, maybe Singapore might come to mind. Um, and, and not many others, right? What do you think Malaysia, as a small country, relatively speaking, can learn from these other countries? Well, I mean, obviously, it is um, always easier to manage a, a city-state compared to um, you know a, a country with uh, terrestrial areas. So, I mean, you have um, you know rural areas as well. Um, so, I think we want, one would must acknowledge that. Uh, but having said that, there, there's a lot of things that we can learn from Singapore, for example. So, I think um, you know, one regret. The good things about Singapore is um, their single-mindedness, um, and naturally, Singapore, being a city-state, uh, did not have the natural resources, so there was no safety nets, for, yeah. for example. So I think uh, the strive for excellence uh, had to be there, um, and they also had the um, courage to actually bring um, talented people uh, into the country, um, and of course, uh, that's being done without um, disrupting. Uh, the, the um, uh, ethnic um, uh, makeup of the country as well. Uh, so that's something which I think they, they preserve. Um, and uh, I think the, the focus on strategy and execution, uh, I think it's very strong there. Um, even when it comes to, say, uh, housing. Um, so the, the HDB model, uh, I think it's actually a great model where we've always said, look, um, here in Malaysia, uh, we have many agencies dealing with um, you know, affordable housing and so on, uh, but um, there's no cohesion and so on. And we've always been recommending for Malaysia to actually look at the HDB model um, to embrace it, uh, but somehow it's actually not done. And uh, it is my hope that um, uh, the government will uh, adopt it uh, moving forward. So I think there's in enough uh, studies done uh, recommendations made uh, for that. So uh, again, uh, back to uh, the, the recipe. Uh, it's about uh, not only charting the right strategies, uh, but following it through with uh, execution and coming up with policies um, which are incongruent um, to supporting that the big objective. Um, yeah. You know, I, I always like to take the example of um, the income level of our people, for example. Um, so we have this situation whereby uh, we have um, unemployment rate which is uh, well below 4%, right? Uh, full, employment. full employment. Full employment, yeah. uh, but by definition. Yeah. Um, and we have, um, you know, officially the 2 million foreign workers um, in the country. Uh, that's the official number, right? Of course, some people will argue that there's a lot more uh, if you take into account the non-documented workers. But at the same time, uh, when you look at the uh, data, uh, and the most recent data was published by EPF. Um, I remember uh, the EPF CEO uh, in an interview uh, a month ago uh, disclosed that we have 8.45 million 
uh, active EPF contributors, but 80% earn below 5,000 ringgit per month and half actually earn below 3,000 ringgit uh, a month. And I think that's actually sad uh, because actually it's, it's very low uh, compared to the rate of progress uh, that we have as a country. Uh, so, for example, um, we've been having uh, consistent um, GDP growth, real GDP growth of uh, average about 5% uh, per annum since the Asian financial crisis. So that's on real terms. You add the inflation about 3%. Uh, in normal terms, it's about 8% per annum growth, right? So by right, um, if all our policies um, align and if we um, increase our proportion of wages to GDP, uh, then the, the wages actually should, should grow. And therefore, the income of our people should be much higher than where we are today. Why are we not there? Uh, multiple factors. Uh, among others, actually, the, the foreign labor policy linked to the productivity uh, and so on. Um, so I think uh, there must be that push um, to encourage uh, businesses um, to uh, employ locals, embrace automation, uh, so that you can create more uh, value-added jobs, uh, high-paying jobs, uh, and reduce dependence on foreign workers. Uh, comes with it also the concept of minimum wage. Now, minimum wage, um, we have this fixation about doing it on a monthly basis. Um, so my view is I look, you know, you should actually look at it on an hourly rate basis uh, because um, that will give the opportunity for smaller businesses that may not afford uh, to have one full-time person uh, working 40 hours a week uh, and paying them 1500 ringgit or 2000 ringgit per month so they can actually be employed for, say, 20 hours. Uh, so that person can then work uh, in one place and then uh, the balance 20 hours per week can actually work elsewhere. Uh, that makes it more flexible, uh, the, the balance between the employees and the employer. And that also gives the opportunity for people uh, outside the city areas, for example, uh, to have different uh, level. Uh, so, for example, the minimum wage in Kuala Lumpur uh, should not be the same as uh, the minimum wage, say, in Kota Baru. So, I mean, uh, you have to allow uh, for that geographical uh, locations, uh, different areas will have different costs of living and so on. So again, it's, it's about making sure that the policies are pragmatic, uh, flexible, uh, but uh, in congruence um, uh, and aligned uh, towards the national uh, objectives uh, and, and targets. Well, it seems to me, Tantri, that um, minimum wage policy seems to be um, a, a band-aid that plasters a dam which has got a hole in it. And it makes sense to do that, right? But some would say that the reason why 80% of um, um, unit holders in EPF earn less than 5,000 ringgit a month is because it's, there's a direct and tangible link with the quality of the education and the ability to command a higher salary because they can't because they don't have the ability. Now, I mean, you have been heading corporations you know, since the, your early 30s, right? Um, your first position of note was as CFO at... Uh, um, I think UEM or was it uh, Telecom Malaysia, Malaysia yeah. right? And let's talk about that. And then you you've been leading companies all the way through until today. You are the chair of Bursa Malaysia, and of course you also advise at UKM and 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 and, and the WWF, which shows the you know the spectrum of your abilities. But then, in terms of your assessment of the human resource in Malaysia, from twenty one years ago, twenty two years ago until today, and your honest appreciation of your abilities, right? The the Malaysian graduate. Okay. Can they command a higher salary based on the education that they arrive that they get in Malaysia, and does it does the low salary justify? Is the yeah are their low salaries justified by their abilities from their education? I think um, uh, Malaysians are you know, well educated uh, in general, uh, and I think the issue that we have is actually the mismatch uh, of supply and demand, right? Um, I think uh, along the way. Um, uh, I mean, let's look at the, the graduates, right? So uh, we monitor the graduate employability uh, for Malaysians um, very, very carefully, right? Um, so we always say that, look, you know, uh, the graduate employability rate has improved uh, from 83, 84% to 85, 86%, right? Then we start to analyze uh, the, the quality of those people who are employed. Then you started to find that uh, this is based on 2021 numbers. I don't have uh, the latest figures. Uh, but 40% of the graduates that were able to find a job within six months of their graduation 
were earning below 2,000 ringgit, right? Uh, and 18% uh, actually had a salary of 1,500 ringgit and lower, right? So, uh, so that's actually reality, right? The graduates that you produce and the salary that they're able to actually command. At the same time, you have that two, three million foreign workers, right? And now we have minimum wage of fifteen hundred ringgit. So the point I would say to uh, our educators would be: Look, um, we're not doing a service to our people, our children. If we put them uh, three, four years into university, and they come out, forty percent of them earn two thousand ringgit and below, which they could have gotten without them having to go to university. So at the same time, we have uh, the foreign workers and we have um, the uh, companies, the EMS companies, the electronics and electrical companies in Penang uh, crying for more talent because they're saying, that, look, now we don't have enough local grads. We need to uh, bring in uh, those from uh, India and from other countries uh, to, to fill up the, the, the vacancies, right? So to me, there's this huge mismatch between supply and demand. So what we need to do is to really uh, go to the ground, uh, roll our sleeves and figure out, okay, industries, uh, what uh, are the human capital talent that you require, uh, in which area, what skills and so on. And you go to the university and say, look, you know, okay, universities, uh, this is the demand and how do we then match it, right? And therefore, making sure that the whatever graduates um, or technologies that we produce will be those human capital talent that's needed uh, by the industry. So uh, it's not a matter of uh, the intelligence, uh, and we Malaysians are as intelligent as anyone else. Um, after all, uh, we have many Malaysians uh, serving uh, in other countries, right? Um, so Malaysians are highly demanded uh, in Singapore, Middle East, uh, in Europe, um, in even in China, uh, for example. Um, so uh, you know, there's no issue about the intelligence. I think it's a matter of um, matching uh, the, the the skills and and the demand um, with industry. So I think that's something which I refer to the congruence of policies um, and execution must be there. Well, it's a very complex and multi-layered argument because then we talk about the universities and how fluid they can be in terms of delivering an education, which is not only employable, but also well high paying. Then you've also got the Singapore phenomenon where it is a very open uh, labor market policy where local Singaporeans compete with um, foreigners of very high caliber for very high quality jobs. And then you can say that they are gross national income per capita is something to the order of 50,000 or even 55 to 60,000 US dollars per year versus Malaysia's I think it's somewhere around 20, 22,000 today. I'm, I'm just guessing at the numbers and these are probably old numbers as well which is about three times Malaysia's um, um, caliber if you like, right? Employability at a salary level. So then it's all about education. It's all about the quality of the education that they can deliver it. And then you as an employer, Tanshree, when you assess CVs from across the board and to fill positions, right? Yeah. Um, what can you tell about a local graduate versus a foreign graduate? You know, and, and why is it that you know, Malaysians today still prefer to send their kids to foreign universities when they can easily get into local universities? Right. Well, I mean, um, in terms of intelligence, again, uh, I do So raw intelligence is one thing, yeah. right? No, no, I mean, in terms of intelligence, um, to me, they, they all have uh, equal talent. It's a matter of exposure, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think make no mistake that um, if you uh, have someone graduating from a UK university, for example, uh, you can expect their command of English will be better compared to someone who actually uh, would graduate from a local university. So, um, and, and I think this is something which you must take into account. And of course, uh, generally, if uh, people who graduate from Malaysians who graduated from UK universities, uh, chances are either they come from a, a well-to-do family to be able to be, be, to be, to be sent there or they had the benefit of scholarships and, and so on. And typically, if they are those who had you know, benefited from scholarships, they would rank among the, you know, the, the, the brightest of the students for them to be able to actually to get the scholarships uh, in the first place uh, compared to those who, you know, who study in the local U. So I think it's a matter of exposure uh, in, in general. So I think this is where um, it is important for employers. Uh, when they uh, employ, you have to look at the background of the person. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a time uh, when I was at Maybank, uh, we were looking for 20 
um, young executives uh, to be the apprentices uh, for our investment banking uh, outfit, Maybank Investment Bank. And um, so out of 20, when the final outcome came, um, I saw the list and it, it, they are mostly uh, from overseas grads, whether it's UK uh, and Australia, uh, very few from local universities, right? Uh, and then naturally, the, most of them were from Kuala Lumpur, uh, in terms of the family background, um, and very few uh, from East Coast uh, and from uh, East Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak, right? Um, then I um, asked for more details into how did we screen them and so on. And I noticed that, the, um, you know, they all have to go through the aptitude test and they were in English. Um, and uh, I would say uh, it would give um, a disadvantage um, position uh, to the local grad. So, so if you're not, uh, you don't command, um, or you don't have a high level of uh, English comprehension, um, you will fare worse compared to someone who had graduated from a UK or Australian universities because again of the language, right? So I think it's therefore important for you in your recruitment policy to embrace that diversity, to take into account background, right? Um, so you don't want everyone to have that monoculture uh, from Kuala Lumpur um, and Petaling Jaya, uh, you know, privileged families compared to people from rural areas. So uh, do take those backgrounds into account. And I can assure you, when we did that, we make it a bit more inclusive, make sure that we have someone from Sabah, someone from Sarawak. Uh, once they are in the group, they are given you know, similar opportunities uh, to excel, they uh, perform as well as the those people from the privileged families uh, in KL and uh, PJ, uh, for example. So the point I wanted to make here is actually um, be inclusive, right? Um, take into account the background of the people. Uh, make sure that you have a diverse uh, group of people in your organization. And I think um, your organization will do a, a lot better. Yeah, that tribalism affects uh, corporations as well as societies alike. Um, that's why, because we feel familiar with the people that we come from, when to school with, uh, of our own background and, and color and, 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 and um, profile, right? Um, so so I, I think a lot of corporations find it difficult to actually put that into execution, into practice. Uh, you can see the same thing in Japan and South Korea, homogenous cultures and, and what have you, right? Can you talk about the value an organization derives from having a diverse background, a, a diverse profile of, of, of staff force? Okay. It, it sounds quite ephemeral because we think, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, want, we want this diversity. And it's not just gender diversity. It's not just racial diversity. It's also age diversity, background diversity, um, uh, educational diversity, right? Local grad, foreign grad. That kind of diversity, right? What kind of benefits can a corporation get? Well, spot on, uh, Chuang. Um, I, mean, I always believe in diversity as a source of strength for any organization. Uh, I mean, you're right, uh, not just in terms of uh, ethnic and um, gender diversity, uh, but across... Uh, That's just layer one, but it's well. layer two and three and four as yeah, well. As, as you, you in, know. Indeed, yeah. So I think um, maybe you start with um, the, the danger. Uh, if you, you know... Uh, I always believe in this concept of affinity to prejudice continuum, right? So what I mean is that the, as a human being, it is only natural for all of us to have affinity towards people from the same uh, race, same gender, same uh, religion, same state, same school, uh, same profession. And so on. you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pinang, Island, Pinang, yeah, yeah. Johor and Johor, yeah. Kelantan, Kelantan, yeah. and, and so on. So uh, it's natural that we have that affinity, right? But we must never allow that feeling of affinity to overcome us, such that it may become favoritism, right? And if you don't control it further, it becomes cronism. And at the very extreme, it becomes prejudicial to the interests of other people, right? Uh, now, um, I've been uh, in organizations where half of the management team members came from the same school, right? Uh, then, of course, when I asked uh, how come that's the situation, the first reaction was, oh, it's all based on merit. I said, no, excuse no. me, how no. is it possible that a school <laughs> that produces 150 people or students a year can make out half your management team, right? A and likewise, uh, when the CEO said from one state, suddenly you find that the majority of that uh, or a big portion uh, of that uh, team members will come from the same state. So uh, I think, it, again, it's actually only natural, but you must never allow that feeling of affinity to overwhelm you. And how do you know that the, you are probably practicing some elements of 
uh, favoritism or criticism or, or being prejudiced towards a certain community. Well, um, if the composition of your team members uh, is disproportionate to your stated purpose of your organization or to the environment that you operate in, so chances are there are some elements of favoritism or even cronism uh, at play. Now, uh, again, you're talking about the, the benefits. So when you have people from diverse background, number one, you avoid this group thing uh, concept because if you have someone from the same background, so in terms of knowledge, it will be limited to that uh, small grouping. In terms of network, it will be limited to that small grouping, right? Uh, as opposed to having people from diverse backgrounds. So, for example, I'm an accountant. Uh, I'm very cautious about not having too many accountants in my team, right? Because, um, uh, you know, if I have um, another accountant myself, it's fine. Yeah. So, but if I have my head of strategy, also an accountant, and my uh, IT person also with accounting background, uh, there'll be an issue. Uh, because it'll be very accounting centric. Uh, so, so I think it's important for you to make sure that. Uh, so maybe the strategy would be someone from engineering background, uh, for example, as supposed to be an accountant. Uh, so I mean, likewise in terms of ethnicity, gender, um, even universities uh, where they come from, uh, and their prior exposure. Uh, so for example, and uh, I, I'm in Maybank now. Uh, so I'm, I used to be from Maybank and on the board of Bursa Malaysia, for example. Uh, our CEO is from Maybank. Um, I'm from Maybank. Tanshri Farid uh, alias joined our board last year, uh, and he's from Maybank. So we really have three people from Maybank. That wasn't by by design. Uh, it so happened that the Datu uh, Uma, uh, who joined Bursa before I do, was from Maybank. But once I have three people from Maybank, I want to make sure that the fourth, uh, the next time we have a vacancy on the board, uh, shouldn't have a Maybank background should be from other organizations uh, for example so that's where you bring diversity uh, so you have someone from other organizations so they will bring in different perspectives uh, into your organization and likewise people who or different nationalities too uh, were relevant right? yeah actually the benefits of that can be extrapolated to countries um, I, I don't, I'm not sure you agree with me but uh, when you compare say um, the economies of Germany the US and say Japan right um, the, the gap between the DAX um, the stock exchange in Germany in the 70s and the gap between the DAX and the NASDAQ in the 70s were not that far apart. And then now you fast forward 50 years and, you know, Silicon Valley is very famous for um, hiring the best and the brightest, right? So whether they come from Croatia or Russia or China or India, um, you've got multi mega cap trillion dollar market cap in the form of Amazon, Facebook, Apple, uh, Alphabet and that kind of thing versus Germany whose DAX has really stayed stagnant through the years and it's a big right. bugbear for them, Right that the Siemens of the world didn't really come up as fast as maybe the German government would have liked. But then the German government and while well, the German uh, corporate sector is quite homogenous, right? Yeah. Male, advanced, you know, engineers, right. quite mo monoculture. La. And you can yeah. say the same thing about Japan as well. Japan has suffered through 50 years, of, well, 30 years of stagflation, yeah. but they've been left behind. You know, now that the world's three, third, third largest economy, maybe, maybe less. And then you've had corporate failures like um, Olympus, for example. And Japan is, you know, old, male, Japanese, right? Very, very staunch in their ways. Right. So, so, so knowing that to be the fact, right? Um, I mean, Malaysia has done a reasonably good job. I think the GLC phenomenon has become much more diverse in the last at least 15 years, 10, 10 years. You did a great job at Bang in terms of diversifying the management team. Um, can more be done? Um... Well, before I answer that, perhaps going back to that country description. Yeah. So I think... Uh, it's bit, maybe a bit too simpl simplistic, um, but it no, but, seems to me that it could be something but, there. But it also must be more holistic in the of sense course. that, um, yes, yeah, so you want economic success, right? So so diversity will make a country become more successful. So as in the US, for example. But you must also make sure uh, that success is supported by a more inclusive socioeconomic policies, right? I mean, we spoke about uh, the homelessness uh, in, you know, in the States, yeah. right? Uh, in New York, in San Francisco, and so on. Um, so whilst they've been successful to raise the income level of the elites, uh, and overall, I think they've been successful, but uh, I think there are gaps when it comes to socioeconomic, uh, as we can see. Uh, and you also have, um, you know, some parts of the States who are actually very uh, insular, uh, in that sense, as opposed to say uh, in Germany and Japan, where we, although they may not appear to be as successful 
uh, from an economic perspective or in recent times, uh, but um, perhaps the quality of life or the people there yeah. is a bit more homogeneous, homogeneous yeah. and in general, there's not too big a gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, in, in these countries. So I just wanted to make sure that, uh, yes, make sure that you have um, that uh, strong economic um, you know, success pursuit uh, but make sure that it's also uh, inclusive. No one's left behind and so on. So back to your question about diversity in uh, the GLCs and others. So I think um, it is um, granted uh, that in uh, the uh, public sector, um, so y- you have more public trust uh, in that sector, but it, by the same token in the private sector, uh, which are non-GLCs, uh, uh, you have the other, uh, where the boob trust make up very little uh, at the management level, right? Um, so I think, I believe, uh, there's room for greater diversity and inclusion uh, on both sides. Um, and I think at the GLCs, uh, we've done well in general, whether it's actually CIMB or Maybank or uh, Asiata, um, you know, uh, I think we all embrace diversity uh, and that's reflected uh, in the board and, and at the management level. Um, at the same time, uh, in some of the other non-GLC entities, I think there's a lot more room uh, for greater Bumitra uh, involvement too. So uh, my request would be uh, for everyone to em- embrace this concept of equitable opportunity and embracing diversity. Because again, truly, uh, I do believe that uh, diversity uh, is a source of strength. Um, and that must come together with equitable opportunity. It means that uh, you provide um, everyone the opportunity to be equitably successful, whether in business or in employment. Right. Pro- providing always the, um, the basic assumption is that they are going to be good at the job and they have the right attitude and they are willing to work hard because it's not just enough to have an equitable policy because ratios and quotas by itself, they don't guarantee yeah. success as we all know. I, I, yeah, so, so, so I use the word equitable, yeah. not equal. Yeah. Because uh, equitable means that you take into account uh, there must be that uh, prerequisite of um, um, merit, right? But you do take into account uh, the, the background of the people. Yeah. So if you're going to go purely based on merit, the poor will remain poor, right? Um, exactly. Uh, so, and uh, the, the, the rich people uh, will, will contribute rich, right? Uh, so all the scholarships will go to the rich people uh, and not to the poor. So I think that's why uh, the concept of equitable is such important. Yeah. Um, and I mean, lest anyone forget, you know, uh, America became the world's wealthiest country on the back of its immigrant workforce, whether it's the Italians and the New English from the 17th century, all the way to the Russians and the Indians and the Chinese in the 21st century, right? Um, that whole specter is under threat right now, as we all have been, we might discuss in the future. But let's go back to your time in Telecom Malaysia. And, um, you know, back in the day when we were reporting, you know, me and my reporter colleagues, you know, we, 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 you came on the scene and we're like, well, this uh, this new guy Abdul Wahid Omar, he's not from MCKK. He's not from some you know upper middle class, and you know he's coming as the big boss of CF at CFO at Te- Telecom Malaysia. And then you went on, you kept going higher and higher up, um, and it's not easy because you know from from someone of your position and your you know your profile, it's it wasn't the formula in those days la. The formula in those days was as we talked about right that formula. What did it take to succeed? And what, I think more importantly, to upgrade that, that reply, right. what does it take to, to succeed in the corporate world? Right. So, uh, Chuang, um, uh, on my part, uh, at a personal level, um, as an accountant, my ambition was to be uh, a chief financial officer of a major public listed company. Which so you when, did at the age of 36. Uh, 37, yes. 37, uh, so, yeah. I was 37 when the Telecom Malaysia hired me uh, as the CFO. And to me, uh, that was it. Um, you know, it's, that was the ultimate the role for me. Um, I never expected to be a CEO, but when that opportunity came um, later in the same year, uh, in 2001, um, I, I took it on. Um, and I took it on because at that point in time, um, I was uh, familiar uh, with the GM group. Um, I was uh, familiar with uh, mergers and acquisitions and the corporate restructuring required to uh, the, to solve and to turn around the UM group. And plus, I was also young. At, at 37, I felt that, okay, if, even if I were to fail, uh, as a CEO, I could always go back to be CFO of another company. So, I mean, hence, I took on that ch- that challenge. So, um, to me, um, uh, for you to be successful, uh, you surely, as a base, you must have a certain 
uh, level of competency. Uh, make no mistake that uh, no one would have all the competencies required, but at least so for that task, for that organization, you must have the basic competencies that's actually required. So in the case of um, UM Group, for example, it was in respect of corporate restructuring. Um, and in the case of uh, Telecom Malaysia, um, it, it was different. So obviously, it, it's uh, telecommunications, technology. Um, and do I come from that background? No. Uh, but I had been the CFO before, uh, so I, I knew the business. So that's actually that's, uh, some part of um, knowledge that I have that I can complement it. So I think the same thing applies um, to all situations. Now, what does it take to be um, a successful person? Well, um, I always say that, that, number one, you must have the basic qualities of being a, a good and successful leader. Um, and to me, uh, what are they? Uh, among others, the top three would be you must have integrity, you must have competence, and you must have humility. Um, integrity, as you know, is about doing the right thing even when no one's watching. Um, and, you know, if you observe uh, if you were to truly hold on to your principles um, your repetition will precede you um, competence is about having the right skills and knowledge to do the job well and uh, it's also about the need to constantly update your knowledge uh, and because we learn new things every day and, and I think we are fortunate today that we live in an environment where there's a wealth of inf information out there uh, that's able uh, for us to actually harness at our fingertips and the third part is actually humility uh, humility is about treating people with mutual respect uh, it's about staying grounded to your roots and it's about knowing that we all live in this world for a greater purpose in life rather than for our self-interest and uh, humility is also about knowing that we don't know everything and we need teamwork in yeah. order to succeed so if you to ask me um, I certainly uh, I'm not as bright uh, as some other people uh, but uh, that element of humility uh, enabled me to uh, help get the help and support uh, from other team members, from my board uh, and other stakeholders too. Um, yeah. So I think w when you uh, embrace that spirit of humility, um, you tend to find that people will be there to support you. Um, yeah. so, so, so to me, yeah, so these are the three... Uh, ingredients, um, the prerequisite to be successful. And of course, you need to work hard and work smart. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'd like to add that what you just described was the basic recipe la, for your, you know, yeah. your, uh, for success. But there's much more to it than that. Uh, than that. And, um, you know, I, 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 you know, sometimes in the last few years, I've been working with uh, PLCs and corporates, you know, to, to, to help their management teams and CEOs to deal with people like myself, uh, you know, people right. in the media. And uh, you, you've, you've, be, you've been, uh, I raise you as a case study uh, many times with, with the participants in my, in my, in my training classes uh, about how your, your style of, of dealing with the media and in fact with the, your, your peers has always been one of graciousness and patience and courtesy and you've been a very likable person. You're a very agreeable person, right? And that has won you favor. I, I think, that, I mean, my gut feel is that to, in order to succeed in the, in, in the world at large, not just in the corporate world, you've got to be a likable person. And I think when you talk about humility and when it's framed in the, in the, in the idea of likability, agreeableness, mm -hmm. that goes a really long way. Um, um, Tanji Jamal of Axiata was another person of that yes. mold, right? Mm -hmm. Very likable, very patient and very popular among the, his peers. Do you think the idea of likability and agreeableness is 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 an important soft skill to cultivate in any aspiring uh, person? No, because you know because you've got your typical hard charging CEO, right, right? right? Very aggressive, very assertive, right? And you know in America there's that that kind of mold lie, you know. But what do you think? Because they're juxtaposition, right? You've got the right. agreeable guy, and then you've got the hard charging aggressive guy. Right. Which one are you going to be? Which one should you be? Well, Chuang, to me, um, I would say just be a good person, uh, be a pleasant person to deal with. Just because you are in authority doesn't mean that you have to be mean to other people. It doesn't mean that you have to always say no, uh, you know, uh, as an answer, uh, the first word that comes to mind. So I think it's important for all of us to treat, again, other people with uh, much respect um, and deal with people uh, pleasantly. Because when you're pleasant, uh, people uh, will open up to you. Right, uh, whether it's actually your boss or your subordinate uh, or your counterpart, right, um, and you get a lot more out of the, the people. So, uh, for example, even when you deal with your subordinate, 
if you're overly aggressive, you're too hard, they're going to be very timid, right? So to be intimidated, you're not going to get a lot of them. But if you um, treat them well, uh, you ask questions in a manner which is uh, polite enough, then you will elicit the, um, uh, that knowledge and input um, ideas from, from them, right? Yeah, uh, certainly the press, uh, when I was in the press, we, we really liked you because you were a very nice guy. You were always very patient with us. And uh, contrast and compare to some other CEOs who are, you know, a little bit less affable, you know. Mm. And what you say is very true. Yeah, yeah um, well, um, again, um, um, obviously we don't know everything. So mm. uh, where we can help, uh, you know, where we can give the answers, we do, right? Uh, but if we uh, don't know the answer, we just um, apologize. We, we don't try to... Be too clever. Uh, you know, uh, too, too clever, <laughs> in a sense, yeah. So the flip side of that is this. Okay, So your management style, uh, being affable and being quite consensual, uh, works in, in Asian, uh, Asian context because that's the way that people of this area are, right? So I just want to get your thoughts because some research from MIT, for example, right? This guy, Jack, Jackson Liu, and his two other colleagues... He compared the difference in, in uh, promotional promotions and success in the corporate world uh, uh, um, from South Asians and East Asians. So mm. South Asians are typically your Indian CEOs, right? Right. And your your East Asians are your Japanese, your Chinese, your you know your Koreans and those kind of CEOs, right? That 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 ethnic background. Typically, the South Asian CEOs did better than the Asian CEOs, East Asian CEOs, in terms of being promoted. Now we can see Sunda Pichal, right? For example, AJ Banga, for example, right? Nuri of um, PepsiCo, many examples, right? Uh, Alphabet, Google, you know, the new YouTube CEO is also from India. So that seems to work. That seems to be the recipe that works in, in America because they love the assertiveness, right? They love the hard charging guy, right? In Asia, much less so. But so, so can the Asian CEO transplant himself from there if he or she desires to go and work in America and on Wall Street, he can't have that. He can't have that, right? Can Can you try and be both? It's tough, right? What do you think? No, it's a matter of environment. So I think yeah. um, we have uh, many Malaysian CEOs uh, who are successful, uh, obviously within the context I mean, of this region. But it's a matter of exposure. So if we, um, you know, if a Malaysian CEO were to be given uh, opportunity to lead the, an American entity, for example, I think they will do. They will. They will be able to do as well. I'm not sure uh, I've ever yeah. seen a Malaysian Wall Street CEO. It's a matter of uh, opportunity. So I think this is again, sometimes one thing which I find that we Malaysians, and me included, I think sometimes we are a bit too shy uh, yeah, to too shy. talk about our success. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so sometimes we are overly humble. Uh, and I think uh, you know, sometimes we must be able to actually be able to articulate the, um, a position where we're able to actually market the, our organisation, yeah. our country, uh, and ourselves, so I think that's something perhaps uh, we can be, uh, we can improve on ourselves. Yeah, um, starts on the family though, right? Because the typical Asian family is like, don't talk so much, you know, eat your food, go and study. You know, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so I think it's a uh, cultural thing as well. Yeah, uh, m- maybe you know um, less of that. So it's about being being truthful. Yes, I'm mean, uh, you know, being humble, but yet at the same time, uh, not uh, to be inferior. So yeah. I think there's, there's a big difference between being humble and uh, having that inferiority feeling or inferiority complex. Right? Yeah, I remember um, Azran Osman Rani, you know, um, formerly of Air Asia X, he's been yes. on the podcast as well. And he said that when he was very young, um, his family always said, you know, go and read books and they were filled with books, the house, right? right. And they were always asked your opinion on things. So they were very vocal from an early age. Right. And Azran has done really, really well through the years, right? Yes. Because I think of, of his verbal ability and his ability to speak up. Right. And I think Cheryl Sandberg said the same thing in the book Lean In with women, right? Not enough women speak up and say, yeah, I'm just as good as that fella, but he's mm. good at talking and I'm not, you know? Mm. I don't want to talk so much. Mm. Um, okay. So you've gone from telecom to, um, you know, UEM and... Uh, Maybank, you know, big companies. Um, now you're Bursa Malaysia chairman. What are some of the principles of dealing sideways, dealing, dealing up, dealing down? You talk about humility, right? What else? What other soft skills? What other things have you learned from dealing with these people? Because, you know, you've done very, very well. And, and sometimes people need to know what, what is the secret recipe behind succeeding in the corporate world. Beyond just the basic things that you talked about, well, I mean, obviously you must have that technical competency that I spoke about. Right? So the substance must be there, and once you have the substance, and people will accept you for 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 what you are, for what you are. 
Now, beyond that, it's a matter of um, how you deal with people, how you're able to articulate your viewpoints, um, how you're able to elicit the feedback uh, from other people, uh, how you're able to negotiate the, um, uh, with uh, your counterparties uh, in arriving at solution. Um, so it depends on your role. Um, there's a big difference between being a chairman and being a CEO and being part of a management team. Okay. Um, so, you know, different roles require different you know, approaches and so on. So talking about different roles and putting on different hats, right? You spent four years in politics as an unelected senator. In the three years. Um, well, three, 2013, 2016, right? Yeah. So I don't know, three to four years, yeah. like, let's just say, right? Um, very different role. Uh, you were in charge of the EPU, uh, Taraju, Equinas, private equity. So, so a varied portfolio and a very powerful portfolio. What did you learn from those three and a half, uh, three years? Well, I mean, just to be clear, um, and, um, I wasn't interested in politics. Um, yeah. I had no plans. I had wanted to retire at Maybank. Uh, yeah. But when that call for national duty came, uh, and someone who had benefited from the new economic policies, uh, government scholarships and so on. So I felt compelled to um, do that national service. But I was very clear that I, I wanted to serve only three years. Uh, and as a senator, one term, say three years. Um, and after that, I wanted to go back to the corporate sector. Uh, in terms of what do I bring into government? Well, uh, the idea was to bring private sector's perspective into government and to give government the courage uh, to uh, devise and implement policies that are necessary but may not be uh, popular. Uh, so, for example, we spoke about the um, fiscal consolidation, uh, subsidy rationalization, and that includes the implementation of uh, GST, for example. Um, so, what have I learned um, in the three years in government? Well, uh, one of the things which um, I've learned is that um, when it comes to stakeholder management, uh, it was actually very easy in the corporate sector uh, because although you have many and different types of uh, stakeholders, but you are able to compartmentalize the stakeholders and deal with them accordingly. So, for example, um, at Maybank, um, you know, shoulders. We have 60,000 uh, shoulders, um, but they all have a common objective. They want um, higher profit, um, uh, higher dividends, yeah. and, and better share price. Yeah. Uh, employees, um, 40,000 employees. Um, again, they want competitive remuneration, good career progression, conducive working environment. Uh, customers, uh, more than 11 million uh, customers uh, then. Uh, so they want um, competitive uh, pricing. They want uh, good products, uh, innovative products. They want great customer service and so on. So you're able to compartmentalize them and deal with them accordingly. But in government, uh, there is only one group of stakeholders called the Malaysian public. <laughs> uh, 30 million nations, um, uh, although we have a population of 33 million, but 30 million nations. Uh, they come from you know, uh, different backgrounds, various shapes and sizes, uh, and different expectations. So it's actually not easy uh, to appeal, um, to come up with a policy or decision that will appeal to all 30 million of them. Uh, so that's actually the, the, the challenging part. But having said that, all you have to do to, is to really look at your mandate um, and do your best um, in the mandate that's actually given to you. Yeah, it seems to me that people who um, who live in a in a civilian world, right, um, they're quite normal. But then when they enter politics, they become a different creature. And time and time again, when I meet, when I read about what politicians, certain politicians say in, in the press, I'm like, how can, why, how and why would you want to say that? But then when I meet them in person, they are very, very nice people. And you're like, this is very different from what I hear and think and read about you in terms of perception. Why is there this chasm, right? Um, I asked Idris Jala the same thing, Tato Sri, right? And um, it's a tough one because when you enter politics, you've got to be a different animal, right? You've got to do things and, and behave in a certain way. And oftentimes, political policies are inflationary in, in nature because they just drive up the cost of doing stuff and in a way impede the country. But it's got to be done for popularity's sake. Do you agree with any of what I just said? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, before I joined the cabinet, uh, I have... Uh, this different perception of uh, ministers. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, there's some element of fear yeah. uh, yeah. when dealing with them, right? So, so, you see them as a different group of people. But uh, the moment uh, I attended the first cabinet meeting, uh, I realized actually they are all normal human beings, yeah. right? So, just like you and me, uh, no different. 
uh, always say in 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 Malay we have this uh, term called ada hati ada perasaan <laughs> <laughs> uh, meaning human, that it's a normal human being yeah. so and uh, and honestly uh, they they they're all normal human beings uh, just like you and me uh, they have uh, aspirations naturally uh, when it comes to politics but other than that uh, same yeah. so uh, i think um, uh, they become different Uh, on the political stage, and naturally, as politicians, um, uh, they have to be elected, right? Um, and to be elected, obviously, uh, they must look at policies. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes popularity uh, uh, will take precedence over uh, what's actually pragmatic, or what's actually necessary. But that's actually a conversation uh, that. That must be done collectively uh, at the cabinet level, and for me, because uh, I'm not a politician, I don't aspire to be one. Um, so the input has just been again the private sector's perspective, uh, and likewise, um, I had the benefit of uh, working alongside Idris Jala, uh, and uh, during my time we had uh, Paul um, also um, in the cabinet. Uh, so we are not tied to any political considerations. Uh, so to speak, uh, when when giving our views, so uh, I think um, I would say that look, you know, we do what we can uh, within our circle of influence, within our area of authority, and but it is uh, my wish that collectively, uh, not just look at the what's actually uh, popular, uh, what's actually uh, pragmatic, what's actually uh, necessary, um, you know, to be implemented, and I think this is. Uh, Something which um, people have to decide um, collect on collective basis, yeah. and of course uh, there are some uh, technocrats. Uh, once they've entered the, the cabinet, um, you know they, they, they like it and, and they transition to become politicians. Um, so, but that's okay; it's a matter of choice. Uh, but some some of us uh, prefer to be uh, in the private sector. Yeah, it's a real. I mean, um, once one one enters politics, one can sometimes be bedazzled by what's on offer. Um, suffice to say, um, you know, we Malaysia has been on the cusp of um, greatness for a long time, right? Uh, people talk about how Malaysia is a high potential country, one of the Asian tigers. has been It's been like that for 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 many n- number of years. Um, And we find ourselves Malaysia in quite a tough spot right now because the ringgit is quite weak, the economy is you know structurally you know quite unsound in certain areas, uh, our education sector needs work and 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 what have you, and um, uh, you know IPO market capital markets. I think we need we need more quality assurances. You know you're the Bursa Malaysia chair. Let's not go into get into the weeds on that discussion, but what. What more can be done to 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 keep you know to keep the economic buzz alive? Right. Well, um, I think um, make no mistake. Uh, times are tough um, at a global level, uh, regional and uh, domestic level. Right. Uh, so the environment is actually challenging, uh, especially when you have um, increasing interest rates um, globally. Uh, so when that happens, um, you know, uh, it be a threat for future economic growth. Um, it's um, going to be disruptive um, to fund flows uh, because when US, Europe, uh, and UK increase their interest rates, uh, naturally there's um, movement back to the uh, developed markets compared to the emerging markets and so on. That that will cause a bit of disruption uh, to uh, to other economies too. Um, so and this is something that will happen uh, from time to time, and it is important therefore for us to really focus on fundamentals. So. On our part, um, it's a good thing that we are very balanced when it comes to our um, economic um, uh, fundamentals. Uh, we're not over reliant on commodities, for example, although it helps uh, when oil prices uh, actually increase. Uh, but uh, I think having said that, the, um, in terms of diversity of our uh, economic structure, um, we're okay. Um, in terms of uh, liquidity, uh, I think we are okay. Uh, the good thing about Malaysia is that we have a very sound uh, financial system, banking system, uh, balance between capital markets and uh, the banking system. Um, our banks are very well capitalized. Uh, they are liquid. They are very well managed uh, from a risk management perspective. Um, and they are very well regulated and supervised uh, by the central bank. Um, 
where we could do better uh, obviously would be uh, in terms of consolidating ourselves um, and coming up uh, with a, a clear policy moving forward and following through with execution. Now, as a country, uh, we have successive development plans, uh, 11th measure plan, 12th measure plans. Um, the, the challenge has always been uh, in execution. Um, so I think it's important as we come up with blueprints and plans, um, all of us must follow through with real execution. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes we get distracted. Yeah. Uh, so I think over the, let's um, no, make no mistake, over the past five years, yeah. um, the, the changes in government um, you know, have been disruptive uh, because the consistency in policies and people get distracted uh, and not really focusing on the real issues. Uh, but having said that, the, um, you know, all these changes happen without any, um, I, I would say, disturbances um, in society. So, yeah, yeah. Been so change government, I mean, you've had the same government for 60 years. When it changed, there, there were no military trucks, uh, no yeah. tanks on the road and so on. And uh, things happen actually very peacefully. Um, so I think that must be a great plus for us. means yeah. that uh, there's some you know, level of political uh, maturity, uh, democratic uh, maturity uh, in Malaysia. And that's uh, something uh, which is great. So what we need to do is to translate that to the mindset of our people. Yeah. So um, and I always use the example of uh, Thailand, our uh, neighbour uh, up north. right? So Thailand is a country over the past you know, decades had gone through you know, coup d'etats, you know, changes in government. Uh, they had the red shirt and yellow shirt. Uh, they, they continued to have um, government influenced by the military, for example, and they had election uh, and still uh, the, the, the prime minister still not sorted out and so on. Right? But noticing those challenges, uh, as a country, they continue to progress. Why? Because they are people, are very single-minded, um, and they're less preoccupied with politics. Uh, their businessmen would run their businesses as well. Many of them have um, grown to become global champions. Um, likewise, their civil service you know, focus on their task at hand and progress. So, notwithstanding all those challenges, they continue to progress. Uh, and they're always on a united front. They will never talk bad about their country. Likewise, Indonesia. Um, I mean, they do have some political challenges, uh, but they're always united when it comes to dealing with external parties. Uh, whereas here in Malaysia, sometimes we tend to talk bad about our own country. Um, so I often meet foreign investors. Um, and for example, uh, the, the people from EU, um, from Germany in particular. So Germans have been investing in this country for a long time. And they've been expanding um, their businesses here. But sometimes they say, look, you know, um, we want to do more. But uh, sometimes actually your own people, missions talking bad about your own country. Uh, and we don't see that as we operate here. So I think if all of us Malaysians can be more positive-minded, be constructive, um, and be less preoccupied with politics... Well, well then right? the next question no, is... No, no, I think w this country can really propel um, and go a lot better and, and, and move forward better. And really focus on execution of the plans that we have really laid out. Well then, Tanshi, the next question is which people are are the ones speaking ill of the country. And I mean, the truth of the matter is, and here we're on, you know, icy ground here. Um, it's like a family of three children, right? And and one child is clearly favoured over the other. And the other two child children are feeling a little bit disenfranchised. And therefore, they may, 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 they may be the ones who are speaking ill of the family. I'm only guessing here, right? Yeah. So maybe unless that structural issues is, right. is at least evolved in some way. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the data, right, yeah. the actual relatives on life, right, uh, it's, it's, actually, right? it's actually very different. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you talk about uh, I understand some of the economic share of the pie and, and, uh, and employability and, and salaries yes, and everything, right? Look, look at opportunities. So I think you look at the, the least of the top 40 richest people in the country, yeah. right? Uh, look at the, the successful you know, people in the corporate sector and so on. So really on the ground um, it is very different. So, so I think sometimes we talk but, so, but here's the, the thing yeah that policy which you spoke favorably of and which has resulted in success factors and successful people like yourselves has been around for 40 years and the, the same imbalance at least in anecdotal terms continues to exist in some, in some form it's been i think it's been 
reduced, at least especially in urban parts of the country. But that inequality still exists. So that means that policy might be a little bit well, in need of work, shall yeah. we say. Yes, so that's it. That's it in the execution. Right? So I think that's why we spoke about the need for equitable opportunity uh, and therefore policies uh, must be based on needs. Right. Um, so I think in many of the cases where when it's implemented, um, it wasn't done uh, properly. Um, of course, there are some elements of corruption from in some places and so on. But um, all those will have to be addressed. But I think if we go back um, based on needs, right? Um, yeah, y- you can be, uh, you know, Wimputra, uh, but if you come from rich family, um, sorry, no scholarship, right? Yeah, uh, clearly. Or, or, and that's already being done or uh, today. Or a 7% discount yeah. on, a, on, a, on a, you know, I'll, I'll try luxury penthouse, which right. actually these guys, they don't need a 7% discount, right? Uh, very true. Yeah. And, and therefore, that uh, discount should go into uh, a fund uh, for affordable housing. Correct. Right? So, so I think um, we do, you know, we must encourage that. So I think that's something which, um, you know, uh, which can and it should be formulated. So I think that's why going back to that uh, equitable opportunity. Um, so give discounts um, uh, and scholarship for people who need And that's in many areas already implemented. Uh, so scholarships are no longer given to children of CEOs, right? Uh, because I mean, there was a time uh, when you know, we opened up the GPA scholarships um, and we found that, um, yeah, it was based on merit. And suddenly we found that, hey, how come? Uh, you know, fifty fifty, Bumputra and Bumputra, but we found that there's a lot um, no, of children, la. Orang Kaya, yeah. uh, getting it yeah. uh, from Which both they sides. You should never even accept, no. even at a yeah. personal level, don't take it because you're yeah. denying the next kid. Uh, very true. So, so I think uh, those, um, uh, in many cases, already address, but I think that should be expanded into all, all policies. But I think th- the thing is. Um, you know, sometimes again, we tend to amplify mm. um, the, the imperfect things. We tend to focus on things that divide us. Look at the glasses being half empty, uh, and so on. But honestly, if you look at the actual situation, it's actually not as bad. Yeah. So you know how media yeah. guys like me, right? They're very cynical people, right? And there is no greater cure for my cynicism than going abroad to another country, whether it's Nepal or Japan or even America. Then to realize, actually, Malaysia is bloody good you know, for what it is, right? And then you realize, oh my God, we've actually got it really good here. We don't have much time left because I know you've got to go off. Um, what are your investing principles? Because I think for someone like you who is very with it in terms of his financial you know, control, right? How do you invest? What is your approach to investing? And I think more importantly, advising people on financial literacy for the young and old alike. Right, I always focus on the fundamentals. Um, um, again, I'm, I, I'm that conservative accountant, <laughs> if like. Hence the premium uh, economy, the still uh, economy, right? <laughs> yeah, so when I invest, for example, I look at the you know, companies that are well run, not in the sunset industry. Uh, then I look at the financials uh, in terms of the uh, PE multiple, in terms of the price to book, and so on. So if there is a company, uh, that's trading at um, a single digit uh, P multiple uh, that pays decent dividend and that's trading at half uh, price to book value uh, that would be the kind of company that I would invest in yeah. uh, as long as they're not in the sunset industry but then again um, you, you know uh, that doesn't mean that um, you know you always make money uh, of course uh, in Bursanam I can't trade um, so yeah. and I don't trade uh, but uh, I think it's truly long term investment um, so uh, my view is actually if you do that the consistently, uh, then I think in the long run, you get um, returns uh, that you deserve. Sometimes you make mistakes. Um, you think that the company is actually well run uh, and over time, challenges came in the, after one or two years. Uh, then obviously, uh, you will need to actually make that uh, portfolio re, uh, realignment. Uh, then you make some adjustments as necessary. Now, in terms of financial literacy, I mentioned earlier about the, the need for all of us to live within our means. Um, it is okay to leverage, um, to, to borrow money uh, for capital expenditure uh, into goods that will bring you benefits in the long run. So, in the context of a person, uh, naturally it's a house or a car that you need to, to get you to work or if you need to uh, you know, drive Grab, um, ride sharing, for example, yeah, a car which is actually economical and so on, it's okay. 
uh, but uh, don't borrow uh, for investment don't borrow uh, for uh, operating expenditure for holidays and so on um, again it's no different from a company uh, likewise um, so company um, borrow um, to invest in their capital equipment machineries um, and so on um, and I think likewise for governments too right uh, so you only borrow uh, for development expenditure uh, things uh, that will give you lead returns in the long run and you don't borrow for putting expenditure for I'm, example I'm glad you raised that because America seems to be not doing that not taking that advice and the dollar seems to be under threat you know again I know we don't have much time but just want to get your quick thoughts on this right de-dollarization you know the debt levels of the American currency uh, the possibility of it being replaced by a, another currency and, and of course the whole US-China thing which we talked about earlier and the social conflicts within America which is a manifestation of the issues that they have right how does one address those how does one think about those things and how does one prepare for those things yeah if you look at the numbers uh, if uh, US were to be any other country then the, the rating yeah. the rating will be uh, a C yeah. Yeah, so it will not be a triple A a rate entity. Uh, and I think that's uh, on account of uh, the, the US dollars being the reserve currency. Uh, and why is it a reserve currency? Well, it's because uh, most countries... Well, they won the Second trade. World War, didn't they? Uh, <laughs> so, well, well, and the, Bretton Woods and the, as a result. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so most countries trade um, yeah. um, using their currencies. Yeah. So, so I think um, for as long as countries uh, trade with each other using US dollars, so the demand for US dollars will always be there. Uh, for settlement and therefore uh, for reserve currencies. Uh, but over time, um, I do believe that the countries will start to uh, get smarter uh, and uh, I think uh, growingly there will be uh, and less... Demand, and um, demand for T-bills have been falling off a little bit, in fact more than a little bit. Yeah. Right? So, so I think it's inevitable, uh, yeah. but it will take a while. Uh, so I think I don't think you want uh, shocks. Uh, so I think um, once you're in the financial system, you must know that you must never create uh, a situation of shocks. Uh, shocks will be bad uh, for the economy, bad for the financial system. So you want to do it uh, gradually. So, so I think it's inevitable, but um, it's a gradual process. And I think um, we, you know, we need to move away from a, a unipolar world uh, or bipolar world, so it needs to be a multipolar world eventually. Yeah. Uh, and that means that um, being less dependent on a single currency. So at a personal level, right, you know all these things. You're aware of the movements, both domestically and internationally. How are you positioning your personal approach, portfolio or, 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 or you know, thinking and all these kind of things, right? Soft, soft, soft reply, you know, the kind of thing. How, how are you pre preparing for, the, for this future? Well, I mean, uh, I come from a large family. Uh, as you know, uh, apart from having uh, 10 other siblings, um, I have uh, more than 40 nephews and nieces. I have two children. Uh, and of course, now, uh, you know, grandnephews and grandchildren. So you're, you're, um, like, you're, you're patriarch now? <laughs> la. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, have a, we are a close-knit family. Um, so uh, we don't have to invite other people uh, for Kunduri, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, our own you know, family gathering will have easily uh, 60 people, 80 people. Uh, Hari will have 100 people, uh, for example. Uh, just uh, immediate family members. Um uh, but I guess um, what I want to say here is that I'm grounded in Malaysia um, and therefore um, all my assets um, you know, are, are actually uh, in Malaysia um, and therefore uh, investments are mainly actually in Ringgit. Um, so within that context, um, I don't invest um, you know, uh, abroad uh, within that context. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities already here in Malaysia. The good thing about investing in Malaysia, is that you're not exposed to uh, foreign uh, currency ex risk. Um, you have uh, that opportunity to generate real returns, uh, and, and especially now when uh, you have um, many companies being listed, but trading uh, below book, um, single digit P, and uh, decent dividend yield. Right? Uh, I think uh, these are the investment opportunities that you have. Plus, the good thing is actually when you invest domestically, uh, that capital is mobilized uh, for domestic economy. It creates business opportunities. It creates employment. Um, so I mean, I would always advocate uh, to prioritize domestic investments beyond financial returns uh, potentially, but there's also that the um, other value-added benefits 
in terms of uh, supporting the growth in the local d- domestic economy and creating more employment for the people. So what we need to do is to come up with the policies that are better so that all this positive economic growth will translate into better income for the people and better well-being for the people. Um, I truly believe in that. Uh, I don't think it's actually uh, it's just a talk and, and it can be done. So you have the numbers. You know what needs to be done. All we need is actually that political courage and cohesion uh, between the, the public sector and the private sector to work towards this common goal. And don't be distracted by occasional, um, you know, I would say, uh, distractions and optional things. Right? From time to time, you have uh, issues. You have um, corruption, um, which must be addressed for sure. Uh, you have uh, you know, someone being mistreated, your dress code and so on. So those are cases in isolation, right? But don't harp on it uh, and make it becoming um, something that's festering um, and making that noise. So I think that's why my request to Malaysia is, look, you know, be pragmatic. Uh, yes, things happen from time to time, but are they well, common or they are in isolation? If they are in isolation, uh, so let the authorities deal with it, uh, but don't harp on it again and again because uh, that will create a very negative air and certainly never talk bad about your own country. Uh, yeah. So deal with it. Um, but uh, you know, be constructive, uh, if I may. So, Chong, if I may, if all of us uh, can do what we can within our circle of influence um, and be constructive uh, and uphold the principles of Rukun Negara, I think, inshallah, uh, this, God willing, this country of ours will do a lot better. Notwithstanding the challenges. Yeah. That was fantastic, Dr. Tanji. Huge honor. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.